It's an honor to be here with you again and on this journey. I had no idea what we were embarking on. And I will tell you that this is probably what I need most. We're back. But before we go into today's episode, and I'll tell you, this is a tough one for me. <laughs> These chapters were thick and filled with like reminiscing about all of the messages from my childhood. But first, how are you today? <laughs> I think that pretty much captures it. It's kind of like feeling all the feels, what we talked about last time. You can't heal what you don't feel, but we're, so I'm feeling today. How about you? I am definitely feeling. In fact, before we were recording, I was bawling, telling Jillian a, a story <laughs> about St. Mother Teresa and her friendship with Pope John Paul. It was just so touching. It's so meaningful to me that the things that I value, deep friendship, love, loyalty, fighting for a purpose, holding up against scrutiny, uh, and just living a meaningful and purposeful life. Yeah. And I think you radiate those core values. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you again and on this journey. I had no idea what we were embarking on. And I will tell you that this is probably what I need most. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was telling you it's reading it for a second time feels like reading it for a first time. And I think it's because it is so dense and our mind starts to go places as we're reading and then our eyes keep going, but our mind is not absorbing <laughs> what we're reading. So I've definitely got a few more underlines and takeaways the second time around. Yeah. Should we go chapter by chapter? Yeah, let's do it. So chapter two, what's gender got to do with it? <laughs> oh my goodness. I was born in 1971 and I will tell you the societal norms the societal pressures. It was so real back then. This is who you will be. This is who you will not be. Are you clear? And we will hold you to this. Girls behave like this. Boys behave like this. And the, the sphere for boy was very nebulous and it seemed very expansive. The sphere for being a girl, it was very narrow on how you look, what you do, how you act, that you're seen but not heard and that you are always quiet and kind. Yeah, kind and uh, yes, like a yes people pleaser. And, yeah. and I was such a tomboy. So I've kind of fit in as I am now. Uh, it's been interesting. I know there is uh, a, some quiz in the chapters that we're going over about your agency or, or your community and kind of how you fit into the stereotypes gender roles. And I think that part of, as I was developing as a kid and how I behaved was anti-oppression was like, I noticed that behaviors of what I was being taken advantage of, or I didn't feel safe if I was acting like a stereotypical gender norm female, that a way to protect myself was to start acting more like a male. So you don't get taken advantage of or beaten up that you're just fierce. Yeah. How was that received both in the immediate environment that you were in and then the larger environment? Uh, immediate environment. I think it was just normalized as a tomboy given, given that sort of name. She's just an athlete, but in my uh, home environment, I was very much powered down <laughs> and passive. And so it, it was like this dichotomy of construct, right? At home to be safe, I cowered it down, made myself small, yes, sir, type of situation. And then I think my freedom was at school where I just got really involved in sports. I have a brother that's a year and a half older than me. So we were close early at early ages. Um, and I liked to be strong. How about you? You know, in the book talks about that. I remember there was a particular section. I don't remember if it was chapters two or three of Tomboy, how that's a status elevation. Like that scene is acceptable that 
you could have more masculine traits or be more active, be more forceful, had be more decisive. That was considered better than the typical female. Uh, I, there was a, I lived in a very domineering house and it was told who to be and how to be. And I rebelled against it all the time. I would walk the line. I would secretly rage if I had to be this quiet person who didn't have an opinion. Uh, and then I, I would get angry and rebel. And I was kind of all over the place, labeled as sensitive. <laughs> yep. Oh, Problem totally. child. Um, it, there was a, a lot of conflict either in my head or in my environment growing up. I really, I didn't want to fall into being told anything and especially being told who I could be and who I could not be because that was what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to climb fences and I wanted to be tough and, and I wanted to be strong, but I think I did that out of rebellion and I completely ignored the tender nurturing side. And I, I think I shut people out as well who wanted to be in that space. Like, no, that's weak. We can't be weak. I'm not going to be weak. Even to this day, I have a very hard time. And it's funny because I was in the military for 10 years on active duty saying, sir and ma'am, like I could yeah. say it rank based, but in general on my day to day, I do not say sir and ma'am. <laughs> it, it doesn't feel good to me. It, it, it feels feels oppressive in some ways. And I've been trying to work through that. Like, I don't, I think it's, it's out of respect. I think most people use it that way, but to me, it's, it feels very uh, like we're elevating status of some, of some people. And it reminds me of being a kid and wanting to rebel. I was going to ask you how the military kind of played into what you wanted to be perceived as, because I know for me, joining the military was part of this. It was, I wanted to be somebody that could take care of myself. I was known from an early age to say, I do myself. I wanted to be independent. And to the point of I, some of our colleagues talk about toxic independence, where I was not able to delegate. I was not able to accept help because I needed to do it on my own. And it was to a point where it became and becomes often destructive because it's exhausting to do everything yourself. But the military was a place where I felt I can for surely protect myself and they are going to give me the skills and also the appearance that I can take care of myself. But how about you? So it, it felt like a good decision. So I, I, I knew I wanted to serve. I believe in service. Craig was in the military. He was enlisted at the time and I applied to uses. And when I went there, they said all the buzzwords that just were like, my heart opened, like, this is where I want to be. This is who I want to serve. I want to take care of people on the battlefield who are putting their life at risk. I want to make sure at home that they're doing okay. I want to take care of their families. So the, the service piece just made sense. I, dislike being vulnerable. I dislike being in situations like with debt. So it made sense from that perspective too, that I could go somewhere, learn all of these things and not be in debt. I'd be in debt with my time, but not financially in debt. So it gave us this element of security too. And then Craig was hugely encouraging on a life of service in the military as well. I think for me, the medical corps is, is different than the rest of the army. <laughs> like it's, it's softer than the rest of the army. I didn't go to basic training. I went to officer basic, which for medical people, we stayed in a hotel. <laughs> they were, they were as fierce as they could be, but overall they were very kind, our cadre and trainers. And I, I didn't feel like I had a defined gender role in the military. Like my role was based on my title, my position and my rank rather than my gender. So I didn't feel like you as a woman have to be this, you can only do this. I felt very equal compared to, to other doctors. Yeah, I resonate with that. We had more of a dorm-like setting for our officer training, but it was also not the same as basic at all. My first duty station was at Lackland, so I got a little bit of an inside scoop about the difference because I could see the enlisted members and how much difference their, uh, their challenges were. And they came and I did a lot of the screenings in the 
dental clinic there. And you're right, is that, you know, it was interesting because I was an oral surgery resident, incoming oral surgery resident at the time. So I did rotations with their oral surgery residents and there was very male dominated. So I think I struggled with fitting in there. I felt like I didn't belong there. I hadn't yet really leaned into the things that I needed to before I could accept that I had what it takes to make it. Unfortunately, I wish I would I wish I would knew then what I knew now, right? As and I think that's the point of our conversations out loud so that hopefully we get people when they can learn the lessons and don't have to learn it as part of the ways that we did. So it it's interesting just sitting here thinking about it now is that the gender roles because among the military family members, there very much were gender roles. So Craig was in a unit when we moved to Fort Hood, and he was becoming a battery commander. And the other officers' wives very much had gender roles of how the wives would be. Like they would wear their husband's rank. They would they would only do things that were considered culturally appropriate for that rank within the women's groups. And I didn't fit in that at all because I had my own rank and I really, I was not beholden to their opinion of me or their opinion of us. I had other things that were way more important in our life. And that was, it it didn't go well. Like, it would filter through to the men and it came back to my husband about, well, why did your wife do this? And why didn't she do this? And, and what is it about this? And he would say, my wife's a doctor. (laughs) She's a captain in the army. She doesn't have time or interest in doing the things that the other women do. And it's not a lack of appreciation, but that's not her life. Like it just didn't even resonate for them. So it was fascinating to me to hear the stories of the things that people would say to him because I didn't fall in those gender roles. Yeah. And and seeing relationships that weren't healthy, I made sure I didn't fit into that gender role. I remember in dental school, I dated uh, someone that his dad was a dentist and his mom was very much fit into the gender role. And that's what she wanted. She loved it. And he wanted that from me, (laughs) but I didn't know it explicitly until I observed where he got frustrated. Didn't want me to make more money than him. And it was fascinating to observe. But of course that relationship did not last very long because I was like, I cannot see myself doing that. I didn't commit this many years in order to, then stay at home, which is also a very hard job, but I didn't have that construct in my mind as that would be something that would be fulfilling for me or satisfying for me, but I do see people where it is. So I take care of older patients in the hospital. Most of my patients are above the age of 70. And it's really interesting, the ones that have clear defined gender roles and the ones that don't. So when I walk in the room and I say, hi, I'm Dr. George, those who don't have these gender roles will be like, so excited. Like if it's another female, she'll be so excited that I'm a doctor and I'm her doctor. And those who have very limited gender roles will be not trusting. They will question more. Their families will question more on if I am capable of making decisions, if I am aware about really what's going on, if I you know, have I passed enough tests? Have I really proven that I'm equal to a male counterpart to be their doctor? And I just find that so interesting. And it's interesting. That is very interesting. Even when people see me in our awesome green cloud scripts, it's fascinating to me to observe what people ask me, do you do this? Most of the time, females ask me, are you a doctor? Are you a physician? The males ask me, are you a nurse or are you an assistant or are you whatever is something that would be more stereotypical. And uh, I also find 
in academia, we talk a lot about the oppression of women and how you don't see women in leadership roles. And I really gravitate towards those women in leadership roles that want to help other women get into leadership roles. Because what I found is that sometimes the women that do get into those leadership roles aren't so friendly to females because that took them a lot in order to come the obstacles. And it just, I can't even fathom, like it's hard for me to fathom that gender oppression is real and then you feel it and you're like, this is so frustrating. Right, right. It's it's who we become to come to get somewhere. And like so much of, of who I've become has been shaped by the external pressures and forces, by the internal messaging that I carry with me about who I'm supposed to be, who which part of me is more socially acceptable that I can show that side or be more of that and less of this rather than just being who I am. The person who tells a story about St. Mother Teresa and Pope John Paul and Christ. <laughs> yeah. But it's so lovely too, to be able to just express and, and it showed what matters to you. So I, I think chapter two is is super important to go through to, to be able to process, for me, it was processing what are the internal messages that I took in and I might not be consciously thinking about it, but I'm living by it, like who I have to be and the qualities that make me more palatable to, to others or to the professional work environment and the qualities that are less attractive and how I, I continually look at the feedback that I'm getting from people around me on how they're receiving the information I'm sharing or my presence in being there and, and taking all of that now from a compassionate lens to say, I cannot control what others think. And I need to stop judging myself thinking that they're judging me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it shows up. I was thinking about when we are stuck in that trap and we perceive them to be thinking about us a certain way, then it could, it could hinder the way that we are showing up right? It's like, well, how do I want to be today? How do I want to show up, right? How can I control how I want to show up? And, and that's something that we often neglect in life, right? We're focusing on an outcome or something we can't control or that we're mind reading. And so then we miss the process kind of like I was sharing, I missed big parts of this book because I was stuck in la la land thinking about something else. And I find that's what happens. It takes us away from the present and we're not maybe necessarily showing up the way that we really want to be seen. We're showing up in the way that we fear that we are being observed. If you know what I mean, you get that part. Yes. Or is it just me? No, no, <laughs> just it's me. not just you. <laughs> it, makes, <laughs> it makes going out to events more difficult, right? Because all of this stuff, all of the chatter or the background noise is there and it seems so real and compelling. And it, it's, it can be difficult just to relax and be present. Yeah. And this, this part of the discussion goes right into the chapter three on anger. Oh, say more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it talks, the book talks about how we as women um, are not supposed to express anger. And often as children, if a boy appears like he's upset, then it's perceived as angry. Is if a girl's upset, it's perceived as sad. And so we're kind of taught not to express anger because then it comes across as aggressive. And if we don't express anger, then we often turn it inward. And that puts us at risk of depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. And I resonate because I have been diagnosed with all three. And, uh, and as I was identifying the role of anorexia in particular in my life is like, yeah, I turned everything inward and it was so overwhelming emotionally that I had to numb myself out. And the book also talks about when we are trying to keep ourselves safe. And if you can't project or at least express your anger and turning it inward shows up as all that negative self-talk and negative self-talk can be a way of keeping ourselves safe in environments where we don't have control and are oppressed. Yeah, I have lived a life with huge amounts of negative self-talk. And I was thinking today about how, what was it that really kept me going? 
because there were many other paths that I could have taken rather than, than the one that I'm on. And it was a belief that there's got to be something more. This can't be as good as it gets to, to keep just striving or trying harder or trying differently or, you know, turning a corner. There's got to be something more. This can't be as good as it gets. Yeah. I, I remember as a kid and, and probably as an adult too, the number of times that people said, don't be so sad. Why are you so sad? And they, and I realized now they had no idea of what I was experiencing because probably I didn't know what I ex was, was experiencing. I didn't have the language for it to know if it was anger or sadness or frustration or just rage. Uh, but it's easy to give a name to someone else's emotion rather than to sit down and actually explore. What are you feeling? Where are you feeling it? Why do you think it's coming up? Just asking those simple questions how easy it is as a human to just assume and want to fix and help them just move past it really quickly. Yeah, especially with anger. So the book talks about constructive anger and destructive anger. And I, I was, so I, we live in Texas. I live in Houston. There's a lot of angry drivers. <laughs> so something that would be destructive anger is road rage that puts people in a dangerous situation. And that could be a metaphor for how we express our anger. And when we have held our anger in for so long, I think we put ourselves at risk of being more destructive and lashing out at times that may not feel appropriate. And people will say, wow, that was taken out of proportion, such as like, it's the straw that broke the camel's back, right? We just keep it in for so long that then one little straw like do we say straw that put the camel's back makes you explode and so then if an outsider is looking at you they're like why are you kind of why are you so like upset about a silly little thing and you're like but it's not that one thing it's this is the culmination of all the anger i've held in for so long and i cannot take it anymore right right it, in the book it says and i think you referenced this too is that when we hold on we when we don't know what to do with that anger we, and we hold on to it. We just start really judging ourselves. Like it's huge. And I, I don't think that many people know how to manage anger and especially don't know how to manage women's anger. And so it's easy to villainize and, you know, just kind of cast somebody out. Oh, they're just that way. As though we don't need to pay attention to them. They're just angry. That's an angry woman. And I remember hearing about it, like politically, hearing people joke about, Oh, can you imagine a woman in a high political office? Because she it's what if it's that time of the month and she's just angry? Look at the policy she's gonna make. And how that was just so acceptable at the time to essentially dehumanize women in general and say you're not capable of having emotions and you're not capable of leading when both are, are inherently not true. Yeah, I find that society does a lot with objective buying women and dehumanizing in multiple capacities. So that's one thing. And then of course, now being able to express our anger is a way that then they can control, right? Because then we hear about gaslighting. This has happened to me recently where I had some uh, very detrimental interaction with somebody and he does not like feedback that's not positive. And I was being mindful of that. And I was trying to provide professional feedback. And um, in, in any time, like there was that friction, right? And I wanted to get away from that friction because I don't like it. It's uncomfortable, but I also wanted to advocate for myself. But I found it took multiple times to try to get myself to advocate. And I kept putting myself into harm in order to try to like teach myself to express what I was feeling. And when I could name it, I'm like, I am angry. I am angry that there has been harm done to me that this person's not respecting, not accepting responsibility for. And not only that, but he is making it a me problem. Like you are the problem. You need to go away. And I just, oh my gosh, to then just be able like, what am I feeling right now? And I'm so mad. And maybe a problem with me is that I like to, I don't like to avoid, I like to resolve. 
So I kept showing up to have this conversation with this person and people are like, you need, because it's a, it's a doctor. So it's not a physician, but it's a doctor. And I won't say what kind, because then it will, uh, you know, we don't need that information, but it's somebody that I put a lot of trust in and caused me physical harm. And it, to not take responsibility, then people in my life, like, do not, don't keep going back. I'm like, but this is not resolved and I am upset. So it's kind of hard to know, like, how can we have resolution without continuing to put ourselves in harm way when it's been identified? Yeah. Yeah. The, it, it's tough. It's tough to not default into patterns of trying to figure things out. It's tough to know when to stop and say enough and when to keep pushing forward to reach that resolve. It's tough to identify strong emotions and hooray that you identified this is anger. This is my anger and that you are owning it and looking for the source of it. And then also looking for well, what do we do? What do we do now? What do I do now specifically? How am I going to proceed with this? I just like the the example I shared earlier, I, I don't know that many people know how to help us with our emotions. So it's a matter of, of trying to figure it out. And for me, it's been a process of, I'm just going to give it this name. Is it ultimately this name? Is it ultimately anger or ultimately frustration or sadness? I don't know, but that's what I'm going to call it right now so that I can move on. My son and I do the word puzzle every day, the wordle. <laughs> we do it by phone. We spend just a couple of minutes on it. And yesterday we were getting stuck. And then I decided, I said, you know what? I think the secret to this is to just not get stuck, just to keep moving forward and gathering more information and not get stuck trying to figure out with these pieces, what word can we make? And so it, we shortened our time. We got to the answer. We were very satisfied with our process and doing it. And I think emotionally, that's how I've had to do it too. It's like, this name has to be good enough. And now I'm, I'm going to process what that feels like, like what that internally feels like. I know I have stuffed so much emotion into this body over 52 years that it, I've had to start unpacking it. And that's been the call to be still this year is to really unpack it and feel it so that I can move on to a better version of me. And it has been in that, like, let's just pick a place to start. It may not be the right place. It may not be what we're going to end with, but we got to keep moving. And in, in that journey, self-compassion is so essential, right? Because what comes up, we could judge. And that's where I have to, like all the mistakes that come up, all the things I wish I would have done differently. I really have to be mindful of the narrative I allow to keep repeating in my head and to just give myself compassion. And this person that harms us, you know, we can't get them to apologize. Something I struggle with a lot is the person who never apologizes. It's the personality I struggle with the most because I will respect, I will accept responsibility for everything that's gone wrong. And that has detrimental. Like, don't do that. <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> but like, okay, claim what's yours, right? Claims what's yours, see how you can fix it reflect, learn from it. Don't beat yourself up for, it, but how, what can I do to make this as right as possible and to try not to repeat that mistake in the future. But when a person I know has caused a lot of issues, just tells you to get over it and doesn't accept it. I'm like, how can we get closure when they will not provide what we're seeking? And, and so it's, that's, that's really uh, tough. So I don't have the answer for that. I, I want to wave a big red flag. <laughs> like, you know, I've had to, I've had to clue in when somebody says it's my fault, like big red flag. When somebody says I need to get over it or get through it or let it go, big red flag. Unless, unless it is said with deep compassion from somebody who I, I deeply trust and who I know sees me and sees the pain of whatever is happening. Uh, but gaslighting in any form, oh big red flag. Yeah. I I've said to myself, how could I show up? That's why I keep advocating because there are parts of my life where there has been harm done and I haven't, you know, you are afraid to say anything afraid of retaliation. I'm like, but if I don't say anything, more people are going to get harmed. We know that chapter four that we've included today is me too. 
And, and so that kind of comes to mind is like, I need to advocate, not just for me and how do I, what can I control? And even if my advocacy work doesn't result in the conclusion that I'm seeking, I know that I showed up the way I wanted to show up. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in med school, there was a a contractor who was a security guard at the school and he would pay particular interest. So if I walked by, he was watching me, he would make comments. He would ask other people about me. And there was one day I walked by him and he said, oh, I heard you did well on the test. And that in and of itself, not such a big deal. But one day as I was walking by him, he told me I had a nice ass. And I like, I just couldn't believe that this was happening at a military medical school. Like, what is going on? This should be the safest place in the world. And then I was, I was talking with one of my classmates about it and I wasn't the only one, it was happening with somebody else as well. So I went to our leadership and explained what happened and it was interesting how they handled it. Like the first person I spoke with said, well, we're going to file a complaint and you'll probably have to sit in a room and with him present, like just saying all these things. I was like, I don't want to do that. That feels really gross. Like it's gross enough to to be here and know that he's here as well. And then I talked to the commandant who was like, no, that person is not going to be here tomorrow. <laughs> and that's what happened. And so it was like, oh, wow, what a difference in experience. But it did require the courage to say something and then the courage to talk and validate that it was happening to somebody else. And then to say, this can't keep happening. We cannot have... Our, we can't have our community being threatened. None, no one in our community. And so that was the courage to keep moving forward and move past that first person up to the commandant. And then it was no longer an issue. Yeah. And unfortunately, as we have read in these, in this book and in real life, like uh, a lot of people quiet because it doesn't end favorably for them. They they receive retaliation or invalidation. And so it's people are less likely to speak up. And when I spoke up, uh, it, it, uh, there were, so we were both in the military and this also happens civilian sector. And, and it seems like the people who have the most leverage are those in top authority. And so it's easier and I find it hard for me now as somebody that went back to fellowship. I find something I struggle with now is like, oh, I feel when someone has authority and not only just from like um, a sexual assault standpoint, but they do not have my best interests in mind. I am not psychologically safe here Um, because most of the time when I use my voice, it was me that got quieted. And it was me who lost part of the career that I love because they protect that person who would be harder to replace. And um, it's it's hard to accept that, you know, but I know it happens to so many people. Wow. Yeah, it's e- it's easier to vilify one person and just call them crazy or tell them they need to get over it like we were talking about earlier tell them it wasn't a big deal or you're not a good fit you're not a good fit for this place or this career type rather than to really look at what is happening for the individual and it's easier to silence people like even women with other women it's easier to just kind of ignore and silence and let it let that problem just be with them rather than to say it it isn't just them and they aren't the problem yeah. Yeah. And our society needs to do a better job at the way that women are portrayed, especially in media and things like that, that make people grow up thinking that the things that are being said and done are, are normal. You know, I, I find that when I look back on my life, the things that I did in order to get attention in order to be loved, quote unquote, by someone, 
very much fit what I thought I needed to be because I wasn't, you know, I was as a tomboy, I was like, oh, how could I be more attractive to this person? And what do I need to do? And I was like, oh, is that in alignment with my values? And it was a big challenge. Dr. Neff wrote in one of the sections about how in high school, she felt that pressure and how she decided she was going to be smart. And I remember making that decision too. How do I want to be seen? I wanted to be seen as smart and driven and, and not a pushover, so strong, rather yeah. than being seen as pretty or attractive or beautiful, like those qualities. I think I stopped wearing makeup. I was like, I don't care what other people think. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> that took so it's funny that you it's ironic it's I remember my freshman year of high school I was known for my outfits I wore a hot colored skirt every day it was an outfit an ensemble with big earrings and I loved fashion but it got too much of the wrong type of attention for me so freshman year all skirts sophomore year sweats sweats all sweats and I I wore sweats all through college and now then scrubs and now I wear athletic wear I never went back and um I remember wearing one of those skirts my dad told me I wore it to church and he said that skirt's too short short to wear to church and so I think I stopped wearing skirts after that I'm like if it's too short to wear to church it's too short so I you know just those things I picked up still remember do you know wet seal the uh yeah, store? yeah totally yeah <laughs> charlotte Russe and wet steel is where i shopped and i was so into it it was like hot pink hot orange hot turquoise and i always wore tights underneath that were also the same color but you know you're i wasn't somebody that wanted to be objectified so if that was the message that i was receiving was that that's what i was doing then sweats it is Yeah, that turning off this piece, turning off. Nope, I don't want that attention. Let me turn that piece of me off. Even though it's something that I that brings me joy. Yeah, I find that part of my eating disorder was very much um, ignited by that aspect too, because it it takes away the feminine aspect of of your body. And so, as I regained health, even this year, I had to sit with those feelings. What's it feeling to be like when you are in a healthy body and your body's producing the hormones it needs to produce? And it's, I suppressed it for a very long time. And I will acknowledge out loud that part of it is for these, this discussion that we're talking about. Uh, and I know that can be a part of a lot of people's eating disorders. So trying to get to the core and find your safe space and talk about these things so that we don't keep falling into the same trap and think that we need to control ourselves in some way or not feel what we need to feel in order to make self-compassionate decisions with our minds, with our bodies, with our lives. Right. So dismantling old ways of being or old ways of doing and really just honoring that this is what a real life or a whole life looks like. And this is what it feels like. I remind myself that a lot. This is what a whole life feels like because sometimes it just sucks. The feeling. Yeah. It just sucks. It feels alone or it feels like I'm not enough or it, it feels like, uh, like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> like sometimes, yep, that that's there. That's part of it. And sometimes that's the answer, right? It's like, how do we shape, how do we reclaim the narrative when it comes to rest, when it comes to stillness, when it comes to not doing, but more being? Like, I think it takes intention to, to rewrite that narrative in our brain. It's mm -hmm. like, we were, I was having a conversation with one of our colleagues and she said uh, something about being lazy and, you know, we're hardworking people, but when we're not doing something, then that our internal dialogue will say, I'm lazy, I'm worthless, I'm not enough. But I grew up with that conversation with being told if I came home from work, uh, from, you know, all the different things I was in at the time, and I just wanted to chill 
and watch TV as kind of just a time to relax, I would immediately be called lazy. And so I, I spent most of my life doing anything in order to not be lazy or selfish because those were the messages I got as a child that those two things would be horrible, that you would be so worthless that you want to avoid those at all costs. And I can see how uh, recently I had a talk with a therapist and she goes, you should just be as lazy, as selfish as you can be today. (laughs) I was, you know, just kind of just like shatter those terms in my brain. And I'm like, wow. So now when I hear other people that have had the same narrative, I relate to what they're saying about what is lazy. I'm like, no, maybe you just need to rest maybe lazy isn't so bad. So if Reese and I are having a lazy day, I no longer place judgments. Like whatever that means, we're resting today. You know, Jelaine, I think that we could take a year off and not contribute to any aspect of human development and still not qualify as lazy. Like I think in our lives, we have probably overworked so much and we have overthinked so much and we have given so much that a, even a year wouldn't even be <laughs> enough downtime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it might take that long to reset our nervous system. Seriously. I really appreciate the story that Dr. Neff shared in chapter four about a real situation that she experienced and then how she responded. And, and she talked about the fierce compassion of taking action and, and the process that she went through to expose something horrific that she had was witnessing in real time and, and how she galvanized support and the different avenues that she took because none of that was easy. And I imagine even thinking about it now probably isn't easy. And it's such a great example to me of what fierce compassion looks like, which is part of saying no more. No one else is going to experience this. I can do something about it and taking action to do it. Yeah, I saw that in the way that she conveys, she had supported a person who later turned out to not be who she thought and to forgive yourself for not knowing then what you know now and what can I do now in order to protect, support, and advocate for what I truly believe in. And she talked about the the subtle things that had happened over time where where it was easy to just dismiss it as, oh, that's just that person. Oh, they didn't mean anything. Oh, they, they... they must have good boundaries, those kinds of things. And I think about on a daily basis, how often do I do that? I kind of tell myself that's not a big deal or it's not big enough. And I dismiss things where where really these are clues to something greater that is happening. Yep. Especially when somebody is doing good where we can justify, oh, because... I do this a lot, actually, <laughs> more than I'd like to admit. But if if I see them in a role, so in, in residency, there was a person who did not treat anybody well, but this person treated her son well. And so I was like, well, she's got compassion. I saw her interact with her son uh, and her husband, and that seemed like loving relationship. And they had a very, what looked like a very, obviously we never know, but it looked like a great relationship. And so I was like, okay, so she's not always evil. And part of it was like, and I took responsibility for what aspects were part of mine. Like, I know I have a lot of self-doubt. I know I'm not showing up the surgical resident that this person maybe wishes I was. Um, but I, I defended her and I still would. And, um, and then with other situations where people are physicians taking great care of their patients, but maybe don't treat their mentees well or their employees, uh, you know, the people who work with them well. It's hard. I know in some hospitals, there's some stories I've been given that 
these people have really bad uh, interactions with the people who work with them, but they have really great surgical outcomes. So the hospital keeps them. I'm like, man, those are the realities of what we have to navigate and how do we control what we can. Yeah. And let it be enough. It's, it's tough. It is really tough protecting ourselves, protecting others, drawing lines. What she says is that women who can be firm and express themselves authentically are happier and more satisfied. And for me, that's the aspirational goal. Express myself authentically, be firm, draw lines, and be willing to speak up. Because I don't think the message, even though it's the message is better now than it has been earlier in my life, that the message is still be quiet. It's probably just you. It's not a big deal. You're blowing it out of proportion. You got to just let it go. Yeah. Are you living in my head? (laughs) That's why we're doing this together. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and also that dichotomy, you know, we think about people balancing, oh, my better half, right? We talked, she talks about that too, and how the yin and yang and that nurturing aspect and the uh, person who's assertive is the same. It's, we often see it as two people coming together, but it's within ourselves. Like we have the nurturing kind of like the tender and fierce self-compassion, but also just the yin and yang and, and not needing it to be somebody else that has that other half of you it's within yourself like we have both uh it's appropriate in different settings to show up a little bit more nurturing and to show up a little bit more assertive excuse me yeah it's like we have a right hand and a left hand and we we can use them independently but we can also use them together and i think a whole life is using both of our hands together the my takeaways from these chapters are an appreciation for how she depersonalizes all of the messaging all of the input that boys and girls get from a very young age so that i could see oh it's not just me <laughs> and so that i could yeah. start to kind of unwind that out of the the different responses that i've had and the different rebellions that i've had against it and start to see that as I do that, as I see less of me in that, I can see more of the person that I'm sitting with because then I can see the the hurts and the wounds and the pains and the reactions to it. I was in a group of women recently and who were we were all sharing our stories and behind the smile and be, behind the looking pretty or being smart or however we have adapted to this world, you could hear the the pain and the things that have been pushed away as this was just me and I had to get over it, but they hadn't. I was like, oh, I mean, I felt so fortunate to to be in that space and to hear real stories in real life. And, and my heart was broken about how we have so deeply internalized this and built a wall around it and built a life uh, to avoid it, but only show the the smiley Facebook side. Yeah. And I try hard not to just show the smiley Facebook side <laughs> because when I first got on Instagram, I was nervous about it because I've heard its impacts, especially with people in body image. And so I said, I don't want to contribute to that, you know, and I try to give us full spectrum. And of course, people will take what they want out of it. People definitely think my life is, uh, you know, the appearance of way more successful with less problems than it is. So maybe I overshare my problems now to to make sure that the real picture is painted, but not in a way that's meant to be showing problems, but solutions, right? It's like, you want people to know where you've been and how you've, how you are processing, how you're stepping out, what tools you're using, because you know, those tools can be helpful for others. Um, So yeah, I, and I also share about Reese. So, you know, something I, that 
Yeah, I was going to say something that um, when I think about my dog, it took me two years to bond with him, maybe longer, because I couldn't feel anything, couldn't feel love, I couldn't feel. And I talked about the challenges with being a, a woman with hormones now. And what I've realized is that my depth of love is so much deeper and so much more fulfilling. So anytime I get upset about situations with changes and being able to feel more, I just really appreciate, yeah, get a little bit more intense emotions, both on the negative, both on the positive. My life is a lot more fulfilling now and try to find the benefits of being kind to ourselves and respectful to our bodies. Yeah. I imagine it was something to get used to that Reese wasn't going to leave. He was always going to be there. It, it was, um, to me, I needed to know I wasn't going to leave because of my suicidality. So I didn't bond with Reese. I kept trying to rehome him in my darkest moments. How does it feel now? Huh. It's interesting, right? Because it's hard to forget <laughs> how low you've been. It's um, a challenge to have a better memory right now because uh, when you nourish yourself, your brain works better, apparently. <laughs> and so my brain works better. My memories of the past are more vivid as I lean into feeling it. Yeah. And what I have discovered is how much I take moments to appreciate friends like you, the communities, because the contrast from a couple of years ago is I used to have to stuff these feelings back down because I was alone. And I couldn't do it by myself. And now when they come up, I feel safe to sit in them because I have my friends. And our community is my purpose and meaning in life. And, and it's so clear to me now. And so it feels good, even though it feels like boo, feels good, you know? Yeah, a big shout out to, to our communities. We it, Just the amazing souls who also aren't going anywhere. Craig and I are not going anywhere. We love you. We love you on the brightest days and the darkest days and every day in between. That my mind knows where all the bodies are buried and and knows what to bring up to really pierce that that sword deeper. Yeah. And, and I think that's why we are going through this book together for the fierce self-compassion. And combining that with the tender self-compassion when when my mind defaults to those things to be like this, yep, yep, there it is. There it is. And slowly working my way towards that doesn't define who I am today. Yeah. And I was thinking, I don't know if it was Adam Grant or someone of the sort who was talking about people with just comparing like enrichment or meaning in their lives and the ones who have not gone through heck and back don't have as rich of a life. And I'm like, yeah, because the advocacy work that we do now comes from a place of knowing and to be able to sit with someone with serious illness and when they're not sure they're going to make it to be able to sit with someone who's not sure that their life is worth living. I couldn't do that had I not been there um, personally. And and so the, like the amount of intensity that I feel inside to protect people, to make sure that they're appreciated, to make sure that they know they're worth it, to make sure they know their life matters. Like that feels like my meaning and purpose in my life. And it would only come from a place of knowing how damaging it was from feeling different. Yeah. Being mute, able to meet somebody exactly where they are and to say you're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. 
and to also have such joy in it. You know, I was just picturing uh, that meaningful moment that we brought up from Sedona when you picked me up in that Mustang, right? And we don't know what the heck we're going to do here, to, but we're together, right? Like we have no idea what this weekend's going to bring, but we're here together. And that will remain one of my fondest memories. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a black Mustang convertible, not joking. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if people don't know what they're talking about, they just have to know that they're invited to join our Emerge community and to hang out with us because you will get glimpses of those moments for sure. Right. Right. And we're just going to journey together. We may not have the same experiences, but we definitely have similar emotions that we are working through and similar narratives that like to pop up at times. <laughs> My dear friend, okay, I think that's chapters two through four. Whew. Final thoughts? You know, a lot will probably come up for people and as it did for us. I just want them to know, I know we reiterate it a lot, but no one is going to scare us away. There's nothing that happened that is so unique that you're outcasted from our community. And we can sit through hard things. I know a lot of what's come up in my life is feeling like I don't belong ashamed of what happened and people don't have to tell us what they've gone through you know there's that inner knowing that will be here for however vulnerable you want to be and we meet you where you're at so if things are too deep you know sometimes I think I can be too much and I want people to never be pressured to feel things that they aren't ready to feel to take their time to do it at their own pace, but don't do it alone. I think that's one of, you offer many gifts to the world. One in particular is a lot of permission to go slow or go at your own pace or just ask, ask for what you need or just give yourself some, some room to move and some, some wiggle room to change your mind to not have to get it right. I think you so abundantly share that with others and I, I so greatly appreciate it. Well, likewise, you create the spaces for us all to come. And as I was mentioning, you shine your core values and it helps so many people to lean into what really matters to me. All right, dear friend, we... I think it's time for us to say goodbye. Well, and well. we will see everyone for what's next, which is part two, chapters five through eight. Yeah. So people make sure to share your comments, your questions, your reflections, your insights. We would love to hear from you. Bye.